What I will try to explain tonight is why at Carbon4 we have decided to move to biodiversity issues. Uh, the reason why we have decided to do so is because at Carbon4 we love science. Actually, uh, we have been established to bring climate science to the business. That was basically uh, what we have been designed for. Uh, and so even when science gives us unpleasant things to hear, uh, what we try to do is to incorporate what science tells us uh, into the way we do business. In order to do that, we need three things. We need to have a scientific definition of the issue that we want to address. We need to have a threshold, because, or we need to have a political objective, in other words. We need to know that we do not want to go beyond that point, for example. And we need methods in order to confront a microeconomic agent to the global threshold. That's basically what we need. We need these three elements. What I will try to explain tonight is now we believe that we have come to the point regarding biodiversity where we have these three elements so we can move on uh, and try to work in this field. The first thing is that we have science. So regarding science, we have a lot of things. Uh, first, uh, biodiversity is much, much more ancient than human species uh, because biodiversity uh, actually it goes back to 4 billion years uh, when the first forms of life appeared on Earth. And since then, uh, we have had on Earth uh, biodiversity without human beings and we'll see that actually uh, the problem that we have <laughs> is when human beings or partially uh, human beings came into the, the playground. Biodiversity actually brings a uh, kind of uh, brings services uh, to life itself. Uh, for those of you who have read uh, the book from James Lovelock uh, named the Gaia Hypothesis, I think it's in English. Uh, Lovelock explains that life on Earth acts as a self-regulatory system. Uh, actually, life on Earth regulates the Earth itself. Uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, services uh, that sustain life, uh, that modify the environment, uh, that even uh, actually belong to our cultural background. Uh, you can see, for example, that the, the, the people that oppose windmills in France partially do it in the name of keeping landscape. Uh, so the landscape is considered to be, which is, composed partially of biodiversity, trees, uh, species, etc., uh, is also something which is part of a cultural, a kind of cultural asset. Uh, so uh, biodiversity brings plenty of services to all the living species, including ourselves, but we could be considered, given the evolution of humankind on Earth, as the major invasive species, which is bringing trouble to all the others. Here you have the evolution of the human population since we have settled on Earth. Uh, you may not know that the human settlements began when we came out of the last ice age uh, and when the climate system stabilized in what was its pre-industrial state and stabilized in that state for about 10,000 years, which was long enough for gatherers and hunters to settle, develop agriculture, and develop sedentary civilizations that we are, that of, of which we are the remote heirs. You can see that before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Earth population was below 1 billion people, and actually the tremendous increase of the human population is one of the consequences of the Industrial Revolution and the tremendous increase of the use of energy, that is machines, uh, in order to help us master the environment. In the same time, we have also increased the individual pressure by a factor 20 or 30, roughly. Uh, that factor can be quantified through the energy use. As you probably know, energy is the, 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 the thing that physicists use to quantify the change of a system. So if we use more energy, it means that we change more the environment, basically. And if one single human being uses today 20 or 30 times more energy than two centuries ago, it basically means that each of us exert a, a pressure on the environment which is 20 to 30 times bigger. If you multiply that by the increase of the human population, it means that the overall population, the overall pressure, sorry, of the human population of the environment 
in a matter of a couple centuries has increased by a factor of several hundreds. Which explains why we have issues today that except for, uh, uh, I, I would say a, a couple exceptions, sorry for the repetition, like the megafauna uh, of Northern America, for example, except for a couple exceptions, basically biodiversity losses was not an issue for most of the human history, but the last two centuries. This tremendous increase of the human population has, of course, occurred on a playground that hasn't inflated, so you cannot inflate the Earth. So the Earth was 13,000 kilometers in diameter two centuries ago, still is and still will be in a couple centuries, and we have to cope with that, even if it is very unpleasant to cope with that. Now, coming back to biodiversity. In biodiversity, <coughs> there are three types of diversities which are generally uh, included, or, or, or um, we, uh, enclosed. Uh, you have uh, the biodiversity uh, in, in terms of different ecosystems, in terms of different species, and in terms of intra uh, intra genetic diversity within a given species. All of the three, are necessary in order for biodiversity to be sustained. For the last century, and actually mostly for the last decades, there has been a very sharp erosion of global biodiversity. For example, uh, living species, the number of living species uh, has decreased. Uh, the number of wetlands that is, uh, some specific ecosystems, has decreased. Uh, the number of uh, animals within a given species, for example birds, uh, has decreased. And the forest cover, which is the habitat for many species, has decreased also. There has been a, a, an erosion of the, the surface of habitats and an erosion of the number of species, and an erosion of the number of individuals within each species. We have had all the three at the same time. If we look at the uh, pressures that lead to uh, biodiversity erosion, we have five of them. The first one is suppressing habitat. Uh, it has been for long the main driver. For example, the forest cover of northern Europe was 80 to 90 percent in the year 1000. And in the year 1850, it had fallen to 15%. So that, of course, was a massive loss of habitat for all the species that live in a forest. Okay. These drivers still, are, still exist today. So we can suppress ecosystems. We can fragment them, which is that we can cut them into little pieces. And uh, specifically with infrastructure, for example, road or rail infrastructure, fragmentates habitats, cuts them in little pieces, and so the frogs cannot go and reproduce in the swamp. Uh, and we can also allow one invasive species, that is ourselves, uh, to go into the habitat if you have excessive tourism, for example, or uh, excessive frequentation. Then a second factor of pressure is pollution. Pollution is basically introducing into an ecosystem things that have nothing to do there. Uh, the first pollution, which, is, uh, act, which has a, a large effect, is uh, chemical pollution. Uh, so uh, you, you put into uh, ecosystems toxic components. Uh, some of them can have uh, uh, funny effects, well, <laughs> if I may say so. Uh, for example, it can change the sex of fish or mollusks. Then you can have physical pollution, for example, plastic pollution, particle pollution. You can have noise pollution, light pollution, and uh, many other pollutions. Another factor of pressure is over, well actually, is uh, exploiting uh, resources and living species. Uh, for example, overfishing is a, is a significant, significant sorry, factor of pressure on the ocean. Uh, it can be deliberate or it can be accidental, but I mean the animal dies <laughs> in both, both, uh, both cases. Uh, you can bring in uh, indigenous, uh, well, uh, invasive species, non-indigenous species, and you can change the climate. 
50 years ago, climate change was not a major issue regarding biodiversity loss. Today, it becomes a significant issue, and in the future, it may become one of the first factors of pressure. You may have already seen this map coming from the last IPCC report uh, that represents the loss of habitat for a two-degree global warming, which is today the political objective, which we are not set to meet, but it is the political objective. And you see that at two degrees, at two degrees, sorry, 80% of the uh, areas of major interest for biodiversity will experience a major loss of habitat, which means that even at two degrees of global warming, there is a very high risk coming from climate change on biodiversity. Again, it's not the only one. In France, uh, we have all the issues also. So uh, we have artificialized land, uh, for example, uh, for the last 15 years, uh, we have lost the equivalent of one département, uh, which is the equivalent of 1% of the surface of the country. We have built plenty of infrastructure. We have 1 million kilometers of roads in France. Uh, which, of course, fragment the habitat, and we also have trains that do the same thing. Uh, we fish too much, like the others. Uh, among the chemical pollutants that have a massive effect on biodiversity, we have pesticides. Uh, as you probably know, there has been a, um, a, a collapse, in a way, of the population of insects in France. For those of you in the room that are old enough to have gray hair or no hair at all, uh, you might remember that when we were kids and when we went on holidays, uh, the, the front glass of the car was full of mosquitoes or other flying, flying insects at the end of the trip. Uh, and we, it, when we traveled at night, the light uh, were also uh, obscured, uh, significantly obscured by dead insects uh, at the end of the trip. This doesn't happen anymore. Okay? And following the collapse of the number of insects, we have a collapse of the number of birds. There has been a very recent article published in Nature, I think, uh, documenting the fact that uh, about 60% uh, of the birds uh, that live in the fields have disappeared uh, in the last decade. Uh, and we also have invading species, invading species uh, but they are well, some of them are uh, an issue, like, for example, uh, the, the Asian wasp, I don't know what you call it in English, whatever, that kills uh, bees in France, uh, one example. So we have science, okay? We, we know a number of things. We know that it is an issue uh, to decrease biodiversity. The only thing that we do not know, though, is to what extent can humanity survive in a world with X percent species having disappeared. That we don't know. Maybe we can live on Earth with 90% of the species that have vanished from the surface. We'll still have food, homes. That is something that science cannot tell us today. So it's one of the difficulties. Uh, it is very difficult to link, as we have in climate change. Well, we do not have it exactly, but we have it more, I would say. In climate change, it's easier to link a given damage to a given level of warming. Even though we are performing a first-time experiment and we will have mostly bad surprises. In regarding biodiversity loss, it's much harder to do so. Okay, so it's one of the difficulties. But still, we have science, so we, we know a number of things. We now have a political objective following the Kunming Montreal uh, protocol. There is now an objective in terms of threshold uh, of, of, of a fraction of the biodiversity that we want to keep, then restore. Of course, in order to do, well, to confront an activity to that global goal, the last thing that we need is methods, accounting methods, that allow to confront one given activity, being somebody who invests in long-term infrastructure, or somebody who just sells camembert, but we need uh, methods in order to confront a given activity to the global 
threshold that we do not want to trespass. Okay? And now we begin to have methods. So those methods, they are not as easy to manipulate as the carbon accounting because we still lack the ton of frog equivalent. Okay? We don't have that in biodiversity, uh, which is one of the difficulties. But we do believe still at carbon-4, uh, and that's why I will end by what I said when I began, uh, that uh, we still have enough material to go forward and begin to design methods that are useful to at least a subcategory of economy actors. And this is why we are here. Thank you. Thank you.